Thank you, Nirmit. Thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, I must thank uh, Gujarat section, IEEE census um, um, section for inviting me to this winter school, particularly Professor Anil Roy, who has been uh, very kind to have me in this, uh, in this session and particularly in the first session, in the inaugural session. So it's a pleasure to um, present this, uh, you know, some of the work that we have done in this area and uh, also to share with you my own views regarding um, what the ultimate, um, ultimate goal of wearable sensors is. You know, this is Winter School on Wearable Sensors and Devices. When we think about wearable sensors, most of the times we are uh, right now thinking of uh, smart watches and uh, things like that. But uh, if you just look within, you are wearing trillions of sensors as, uh, as a product of nature. Okay, We all carry so many sensors with us. And uh, these sensors are made in very different ways. They have, they even use transductions, which are very different. So I thought it would be very apt to go through nature's transducers, at least some examples in this first talk and see how nature does these things, right? So that's why I'm talking about discovering engineering design templates in nature's transducers today. Um, where um, I am located right now is uh, Bangalore. Most of you know, this is in the southern part of the country, right uh, in the center of uh, this peninsula here. So um, here is Bangalore, and this is Indian Institute of Science. If uh, you haven't been here, it's a, it's a remarkable campus, beautiful green campus. What you see uh, as my background is, is the campus, uh, you know, from the campus itself. Um, and uh, this is the main building of the campus. I'm just going to show you a couple of slides uh, about where I am, and then we'll talk about nature's transducers. So this is, this is sort of, um, this is the aerial view of, um, the Indian Institute of Science campus, you can see that around this, it's all concrete jungle, but this is a beautifully green campus. And in this campus, there is the Center for Nanoscience and Engineering that I was fortunate to be a founding chair of, uh, work with some of my colleagues to, to found the center. This uh, is uh, an incredibly good place to work. This uh, house is fantastic facilities. It has nano fabrication uh, facility with 14,000 square feet of clean room. Uh, this is as good as it gets anywhere in the world. It doesn't matter where you go, you know, which, which are your favorite universities, whether it's Berkeley or MIT or Stanford or whatever it is, you can go and compare and uh, you will not find anything better. Um, so this this uh, nanofab facility provides all kinds of tools, uh, you know, for people who work in sensors and transducers to build their devices. Okay. Uh, a, a lot of emphasis is, of course, on uh, semiconductor devices because it started as the nanoelectronics uh, center for uh, center of excellence for nanoelectronics. And therefore, uh, there is plenty of emphasis on nanoelectronics in the center, and therefore facilities also cater to, um, you know, wafer scale processes. But it is versatile enough that it can accommodate all kinds of uh, other substrates as well, not just silicon. And uh, you can you can work here. Um, it's open to the whole country. There are researchers from all over the country who use this facility. There are 700 institutions of India that use our facility under Indian 
Nano Electronics Users Program, which is called INUP. And along with the NanoFab facility, we also have a micro and nano characterization facility. This picture is from that facility, which has uh, all kinds of tools for mechanical and uh, electrical material and optical characterization. So, you know, that's, that's sort of uh, the background where I work and uh, where I uh, do the kind of things that I'm going to show you. So let's talk about now, what I'm going to present to you, um, I will talk about biomimetics versus bio-inspired engineering. I do make a distinction between the two. Um, word of insects and insect design, something that interests me quite a bit, because when we think about micro and nano engineering, uh, there is no better example of uh, world of insects and you know what kind of designs exist for sensors and actuators in them. So then my goal of uh, looking at this world of insects is to uh, basically discover the design templates that nature uses and the scaling rules that it uses because you know it's not like nature is uh, designing everything from scratch differently all these you know billions and trillions of uh, insects and animals that we have, you know, there are uh, modules that, uh, you know, nature uses in all of them. You know, it's, it's like uh, if you look at the eyes of human beings or animals, or you can see the similarity that they have, you know, so there are, this is modular design, you know, that there are <laughs> modules which are used everywhere. And of course, that comes from, uh, you know, you know how uh, genetic evolution has taken place. So <clears throat> I will give you two examples. I'll discuss just two examples, uh, you know, among a few things that we have studied and then we'll uh, conclude. Now, when you think about nature's engineering, uh, you know, here is a quotation from Da Vinci. Uh, you know, I, I, I admire what he says here. While human ingenuity may devise various inventions to the same ends, it will never devise anything more beautiful, nor more simple, nor more to the purpose than nature does. Because in her inventions, nothing is lacking and nothing is superfluous. This is his quotation. And I love this, this part because this is what I keep discovering when uh, we study uh, nature's designs or nature's engineering how beautiful those designs are and how efficient those designs are and uh, what can we learn from them you know so that's that's what uh, this talk is about so bioinspired engineering is about learning the principle of operation uh, that nature is using and the kind of kind of design template that it is using and rule of scaling that it is using you know can you do these three, can you understand these three and can you bring them to bear on the kind of engineering we do? That's what I call bio-inspired engineering. It's not just about uh, mimicking the function, which is what uh, biomimetics is. Biomimetics generally mimics the function, not necessarily uh, you know, looking at uh, these, these other factors that uh, I told you about. So nature's design, you know, if you look at it, the material that nature uses is all organic material, of course. And uh, you find that there is very complex transduction scheme that is used uh, by nature's transducers. This complex transduction scheme, you know, you will see uh, some examples. But uh, this, is, this is not as simple as what we use in our transducers. And there are the templates, the design templates are hidden. We have to discover them. It's not, by no means it is obvious that how does, uh, how does it work? Even if you see it functioning, you know, the, 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 the design template by that, what I mean is something which is uh, then scalable and usable in, in uh, different sizes and shapes. That template is generally uh, not easy to discover. Now, biologists have obviously studied, uh, 
you know, uh, life forms, insects or animals and humans forever. So when biologists look at uh, these entities, they look for form, function, and evolution. You know, this is what biology studies. It does not necessarily study design. This is what engineers study, you know, design. How do you design things? How do you do it so that, uh, you know, you can make various copies of it? So this is where our work begins. So when you look at biosystems, you know, the science of it, quite a bit of it is known. And biology has, uh, our biologists have studied these systems for so long that we have minutest of details of, uh, of uh, you know, up to the molecular level of all organelles of everything. So the science part of it is known quite a bit. That doesn't mean that we know everything. Of course not. As you know, um, even today in 21st century, we know so little about how brain works. So um, let's say that, okay, quite a bit of, uh, of biological systems we do know. Technology that are used for biosystems, it's all molecular uh, technology. This is not what we do. Um, you know, at uh, at the human level, the kind of engineering that you we do, there is there are very few things which are made with molecular manufacturing or mole molecular engineering. Okay, uh, ever since nanotechnology arrived, uh, this is getting a lot of impetus. Engineering of biosystems is very complex, very complex because it's so intertwined. But when you discover something, you find that it's extremely elegant. And I'll show you some examples of that. So the insect world motivation comes from the fact that nature's transducers are usually very smart. Nature's designs are very elegant. And design optimization is necessarily adaptive. You know, you know that, and this is part of evolution. Energy usage is usually minimal. And the choice of transduction is brilliant. So, um, you know, these, these are the things that interest me the most. We would like to discover, discover these design templates and scaling laws so that we can then uh, try to make uh, similar brilliant designs uh, with, with the kind of materials we have access to. Microsystem, uh, you know, for microsystems, if you are looking for inspiration, you know this is this is a, a fly called fairy fly. Okay, now uh, these are wasps or parasitoids actually, and look at the size of it. You know this is just two hundred micrometers in size. You know, please recall, you know the the scale, the ruler that you want to keep in your head for microengineering is uh, the diameter of your hair, which is roughly about 100 micron. So two, um, two hair strands put side by side is, is the length of this thing, right? Now this one has, um, <laughs> this, is, this is the whole insect, right? So it has sensors, transducers, processors, everything packaged in this form, in this, uh, you know, in this, in this tiny scale. So imagine that, you know, that how nature has been able to do this kind of engineering, that in 200 microns, it has packaged everything there, including the packaging, it's 200 microns, right? So you have sensors, you have uh, actuators, you have decision-making processes, everything there. Right. This is an amazing piece of engineering, no matter how you look at it. So, you know, um, and, and this is just a picture that um, somebody took. Uh, it was on National Geographic, uh, you know, website of this insect. So I love this picture. And, you know, look at, at the wings. It has these hair-like structures, which are actually sensors, you know, for, for finding out uh, 
where to lay eggs, you know, for for doing reconnaissance of the of the location where it must lay its eggs. And there is a lot to lot to this insect, and I won't be able to do justice by telling you one or two things. But if you look at this hair-like structure, which I senses, this is already at the limit of uh, normal photolithography that we do in in uh, uh, silicon. You know, uh, I'm not talking about the kind of acrobatics which is done with uh, photolithography today with extreme UV and stuff like that. But you know, in normal labs, when you do photolithography, you can't go below one micron feature size. And this is this is the kind of structure that it grows, you know, by itself. So nature's package systems, if you look at, and if you look at their their size, you know, I'm just trying to do a sort of a size comparison here. Therefore, I have put the fairy fly here. You can't quite see it. Okay, uh, it's very small. But let's say you know 200 microns, and there it is. You know, go 10 times higher. You go go to a fruit fly okay uh, which is uh, you know basically the scientific name is drosophila melanogaster so this fruit fly about 2 millimeters in length right and and uh, fruit flies you know uh, they go to fruits so easily how do they know where fruits are of course it is with their smell sensors so they have, you know, these, these have approximately 60 odorant receptors you know, uh, packaged in this 2 mm size, right? That's what their main sensors are, these uh, odorant receptors or uh, smell sensors, let's say, okay? So in this, uh, in this size, um, you have so many of them. However, in the same size, ants are about the same size but ants have 400 odorant receptors, okay? They're far more odorant receptors than these have because ants, of course, go to, uh, you know, all kinds of food. They can smell uh, various things and therefore they have a variety of these. And then you go 10 times higher in size, you go to 20 millimeters and you have a honeybee, right? So honeybee not only smells, it does, a lot more things. It has uh, it has a brain size of about one millimeter cube, and in that one millimeter cube brain size, it has roughly about a million neurons. Okay, a million neurons. Now, one millimeter cube is the size of this, whereas our brain has a size of about twelve hundred centimeter cube. Okay, so it's. Uh, it's roughly six orders of magnitude bigger, our brain. But we also have roughly about 85, 86 billion neurons to help us uh, do various things that we do. So complexity of fun increases. And of course, you know, along with that, all kinds of uh, receptors and sensors, the, the, the numbers of those increases. So you can, you can see that the complexity that nature's systems have, we are nowhere, nowhere close to that, no matter what kind of, uh, you know, engineered system you look at, okay? So this is, this is the kind of, uh, uh, you know, inspiration you want to have if you want to work in this area. Look at this, these compact systems with so many sensors and transducers. Okay. So, um, you know, uh, there is there is some sort of scaling that nature has, you know, I mean, if you look at the picture here, right, fruit fly and the honeybee look very similar and, uh, you know, functions increase and, and so, so does the design inside. Our package system, look at now the, the human packaged systems, right? This is, uh, this is the evolution of, uh, phone, you know, um, I don't know, maybe in the audience there are people who have never seen these phones, but uh, soon enough you will see them in uh, museums. Um, but you might have seen these phones because these mummy daddy phones still exist uh, and are used. And then came this uh, 
new kid on the block which stole the show and it's called the smartphone. So what is so smart about the smartphone? Why is it called smartphone? Because it has a lot more sensors, okay, inside it. It doesn't just do, uh, you know, this voice transmission for which you still need a sensor. You need a microphone. You also need uh, a, a transmitter. You also need, you know, um, if it has a speaker, then you have to have a, a transducer or actuator also in it, right? So this is what uh, uh, is happening right now that uh, far more sensors are being packaged here. And these are the, the same sensors, uh, you know, which we are using in wearables too. So they are becoming smaller and smaller. Typically, you know, the cell phones that you have today have 10 to 15 sensors in them. But in about two, three years time, or perhaps in five years max, we are expecting the number of sensors in cell phones to be anywhere between 100 to 1000. Okay, that's where we are headed. So now let's look at the bioacoustics of cricket. Okay, this, is, this is one example I, I, I want to give you, which we have studied. So this is our friend cricket, okay? And see all what it is doing is, you know, uh, moving its wings, okay? And that's how it makes that loud sound, okay? Uh, it's not, it's not, it doesn't have vocal cords. It's not singing from its, uh, you know, its vocal cords. It's just these wings which are going uh, in angular motion, and that is what is producing the sound. Now the magic is how. How does this, um, you know, fascinating loud sound come from such a small volume? If you compare that with what we make, let's just say these are, you know, your usual computer speakers that you put by the side of your computer to play music, uh, you know, at 10 centimeters with these big speakers, you get about 95 dB, okay? Uh, when you are normally talking, you know, to your friends, colleagues, about at 10 centimeters, 75, 76 dB sound we have, okay? And, uh, you know, these um, buzzers produce about 70 dB at 10 centimeters. This tiny insect, the cricket, right? Very, very small. 80 dB at the same distance, the 10 centimeters, 80 dB. Very, very loud sound. And we are all familiar with this, with this uh, sound, right? We all know many a times uh, if you are having trouble sleeping and there are crickets singing outside, then you start cursing them that you're not able to sleep because of them. Although they are singing, they are not making noise. Um, <clears throat> So if you look at them, what we have, we have done research on them uh, with, a, with a colleague from uh, ecology department, Professor Rohini Balakrishnan, uh, we got them in the lab and, uh, you know, I mean, ecologists have studied uh, them for a very long time. So has uh, Rohini Balakrishnan. But, uh, you know, we, we were trying to figure out this entire mechanical uh, mechanism that the cricket uses uh, to produce the sound. And that's why we started doing experiments. Not just that, you know, these cricket species, uh, what, what song you hear, it's their love song. It's meant to uh, attract the female crickets. So now there are so many species of crickets, okay? These are all, you know, the nine species I'm showing you here, these are all field crickets, called field crickets. There are bush crickets, there are tree crickets, there are different kinds of crickets, many of them. But just the field crickets, they have a very fixed calling frequency at which they are singing. You know, it's like each cricket has its own FM radio station, okay, if you will. So, you know, it's uh, somebody is singing at 4.3 kilohertz, somebody is singing at 6 kilohertz, somebody is singing at 7 kilohertz, and but we find that normally between three kilohertz to seven kilohertz, all of these field crickets are, uh, have, their, have their calling frequency. So again, you know, why? Why between three and seven? You know, if you are studying in, uh, design, then 
obviously you are going to ask why not two why not 10 why not 20 why why are they limited in this range and that's the smartness that nature is hiding from us that you have to discover by studying this system okay so look at whenever i look at any system as an engineer i'm trained to think of it like this okay there is a system there is some input there is some output and the system is what transforms the input to the output and of course you know if you are electrical engineer then you think uh, about this all the time and the first thing you want to think is okay what is the transfer function okay what is can i find the transfer function of course if it is a linear system that's easy but Otherwise, um, you know, it's not very easy to do. So here is what the input is. What we see is the wing, wing beat. You know, the wing is going like this, you know, in angular fashion, um, uh, angular motion. And the wing is going at 30 hertz, approximately, 29, 30 hertz. Now, 30 hertz is not something that you can hear. It's, it's absolutely inaudible. Okay, although we say that 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz we can hear, but you know, not not us, not adults. You know, maybe kids can uh, when you are two years old, maybe you can hear that. But after that, we start losing that uh, quite fast. So this low frequency, inaudible uh, motion that you see or vibration that you see somehow gets converted into high frequency loud sound. How is that? What is it in the system that is doing this conversion? Where is this low frequency? How is the low frequency becoming high frequency? Where is the fre frequency multiplier? And where is the loudspeaker? Where is the amplifier that is making this inaudible sound into 80 dB sound at 10 centimeters? So where are, where are these things? And that's what you're trying to find. This is all mechanical. That's how I got interested in uh, studying this cricket. So the mechanism we see is wing beat that's the actuation and some frequency multiplier and then there's some loudspeaker okay some resonator and that's what we are looking for so when you look at the wing stridulation as i said it's at 30 hertz and this wing this cricket wing has this part here okay uh, which is uh, you know, a, a file, you know, it has a set of teeth underneath. Okay, I'll, I'll show you in greater detail. Set of teeth is like this. And on the other wing, when it goes on top, so on the other wing underneath, there is a hard tissue called the plectrum that goes over this set of teeth. Okay, and uh, when it goes over set of teeth, it is plucking each teeth and pushing it up little bit and that's how it is doing this impulsive sort of impulse train of displacements at at this uh, at this file okay and that set of impulses set this part into motion this part is called the harp it's a very thin section of the wing this harp gets set in vibrations and it so turns out that when the series of displacement impulses start vibrating this harp, the harp's natural frequency is matched by the impulse frequency. And that's what sets it into resonance. And when you, when you get into resonance, you have very high amplitude of motion. And therefore, you, know, you get this you know, high amplitude vibration, which results into a much higher sound output. And that's how this harp acts as loudspeaker or acts as, uh, you know, the amplifier. So this is, this is the whole thing. Now, here is the cricket. Here is, as I said, you know, on the wing, there is this file. If you look under the file, this is the kind of set of teeth you see. Now, look at that. Look at that. Think about what Da Vinci, da Vinci said, that never so beautiful i mean look at this this incredibly beautiful and precise manufacturing of this actuator which is done by nature right and this is at micron scales mind you right and this is the plectrum here okay so this is the set of teeth over which the plectrum goes and pushes it down okay amazing amazing sort of, uh, uh, you know, 
this is the kind of uh, arrangement uh, it has and the kind of manufacturing it has. So if you look at the set of teeth and if you look at you know, the sizes, the insect length is in centimeters, the harp area is in millimeters, the harp thickness is in micrometers, file tooth pitch is in mi micrometers, tooth height in micrometers. You know, so this is all uh, microengineering that you have. And number of teeth varies from 40 to 250. So each tooth, remember that, that each tooth is giving one impulse. So if you have 100 teeth, then you get 100 impulses, right? 100 impulses. That means if the wing is going once at 30 hertz, the number of impulses is 3000, right? So you can, you can naturally get from there 3000 um, vibrations in a second, which means you already got three kilohertz, right? So that's how the frequency multiplication is working. This, this is the frequency multiplier. This teeth and plectrum arrangement is, a, is the frequency multiplier. And uh, this is just to show you that how uh, you know uh, how it pushes the plectrum pushes the set of teeth in one sweep of the wing. Okay, so one stridulation, the sweep of the wing is called stridulation of the wing translates into multiple impacts on the harp. So you know you have this set of teeth here, and you have this kind of impulsive uh, you know loading on it, right? <clears throat> so moving impacts on resonating structure. This is at three point nine kilohertz, and uh, that is giving you uh, uh, the vibrations that ultimately produce the sound. Now, if you look at this, you want to create a model. You want to study this model that, okay, um, how does it produce this loud sound? Can we predict that? So now you take this structure of the wing, okay, and you, you have taken its image, you know, do some image processing, in MATLAB, you can easily get the boundary coordinates, and you can you can create a finite element uh, mesh for this. Uh, we use shell elements for studying the wing because it's a very thin structure, but it also has these veins running through uh, uh, through the wing. So those veins are not the same thickness as the rest of the wing. They have they they are harder and uh, they are thicker tissues. Right, so veins can also be modeled and you can model them with uh, 3D elements, um, solid elements in, in finite element analysis. So we did all this, okay? So you have the geometry, you have the loading, you need material properties to be able to run a model or create a model where you can, uh, where you can see the response of how it oscillates, how it vibrates, and what kind of sound it produces. So material properties, you need to know Young's modulus of cricket wing, okay? So we did some nano indentation tests on this, uh, uh, on, the, on the wing, and, <laughs> and found that uh, the average value is 6.4 uh, gigapascal. Now there is a story behind this, you know, before we started doing this research, the entire community of ecologists was using 50 GPA, 50 gigapascals as the Young's modulus for this. And when my student told me that, so, you know, people are using 50 GPA for uh, Young's modulus, I told him that people have to be out of their mind. How can it be 50 GPA? 70 GPA is the Young's modulus of aluminum. You know, it cannot be so high. It's, it's a tissue. It's a biological material. It can't be so hard. Uh, so I, I told him that, you know, please find out what is the origin of that um, 50 GPA number? Where does it come from? And, um, you know, he dug up all the papers that, uh, you know, were referring to this and then finally found the original source, which was referring to a German paper. It was written in German. And that paper, you know, actually says in the paper, <laughs> that I asked my brother who is a mechanical engineer, what should be the youngest modulus of uh, this cricket ring. And my brother did a kitchen experiment with, uh, you know, with a string, he attached the wing and he, he did some oscill uh, torsional oscillations and he said, oh, it will be about 50 GPA. And 
that's what everybody was using unbelievable anyway i was i was uh, completely convinced that that's a wrong value and therefore we did this studies and found that uh, okay it's an order of magnitude lower so we did this impulse loading okay so you have now everything you have the geometry you have uh, <laughs> you have uh, material properties you have loading boundary conditions are still little shaky but we worked on the boundary conditions for about 6 months to figure out what the right boundary conditions are <coughs> for the harp embedded in the wing and then we were able to do the simulation and this is the kind of response we got okay from our finite element model and this is the response actually recorded from a cricket while singing okay so look at this so this is the envelop that we were trying to get to that where does this come from where does this beat like phenomenon come from and that we were able to capture with our finite element model so when we did that i uh, asked my student uh, you know <clears throat> whether he could convert this into a uh, uh sound file you know the the displacement uh, response that we had um uh, he could convert into a sound file and play it back to see what it sounds like and vamsi who worked on this vamsi was a very very smart student he said yes i'll you know i can do it and he did it and this is what it sounds like so this is the finite element cricket singing okay finite element uh Uh, based model of the cricket wing that is producing the sound and once you do its fft and you look at you know what what does the fft look like you know um you find incredible similarities between uh what what the fft of the field produced uh sound is and what is the fft of so th these are you know first i played the from fm analysis and this is recorded from the field for this particular you know t potentesis uh, you know species of crickets and as i said that look at the fft of it the central frequency and the spread around the central frequency this is recorded from the field okay so you can see that we got very very close of course you are you are never going to get right on top of it because the complexities in the real system are so many plus you know you also see a lot of noise here because this is recorded from the field where you have a lot of reflection from leaves and what not so it's not the same but you get the essential feature is captured here so then the next thing to think about was why do crickets have this uh, or how do they have this different radio resonances for themselves why do they have this characteristic frequency for themselves right you know how how does that come about what does nature do in their design to get them this unique frequencies or does how does the nature do spectrum allocation unlike uh, how government does you know spectrum allocation so uh, here how does nature do it it does it by design you know so the design now ecologists have been looking at it and they they have been curious about it that that why does a particular cricket have this frequency or that frequency and uh, they tried to figure out that is the frequency related to the area of the harp is it related to pronotum width is it related to file length is it related to file to spacing they have they have plotted these uh, results against everything that they could measure but none of this could capture what the essential design feature is which changes the frequency and that's where this engineering template is so to understand how the song frequency varies varies across the species we started doing this uh, simulations okay now you have a uh, uh, a good model it is validated and once it is validated then you can do tons of analysis so what we do is we take the area okay and we normalize the area okay is scaling factor of lateral dimensions with uh, with the most common 
cricket by maculatus you know so we normalized it with with the size of uh, of the harp that by maculatus has and uh, put that here on the x axis and the thickness of the uh, of the harp we put on this axis again normalized by the thickness of the by maculatus uh, harp okay you you need normalization for scaling right so we did this and then we ran thousands and thousands of simulations to see that what combinations of these two produces what frequency so what you are looking at here is these curves are isofrequency lines that means if you follow just one line it is 4 kilohertz line so there are lots of combinations of these scaling factors two scaling factors that produce the same uh, frequency okay so these are contour plots now uh, if you look at these curves then you feel like that there is you know it looks like a one parameter family of curves and then you want to get to that parameter what is that parameter which is giving this um, uh, variation and if you look at uh, the frequencies of the known crickets we know their sizes we know their thicknesses the thickness of the harps so if we plot that it's right here you know the clustering is all here in a very small part of this two dimensional space design space they are all here okay so now after understanding this we figured out what that one parameter is and that is thickness divided by the lateral dimension square square is just for the area you know it's basically the area of the harp okay but you don't have to have you know exact area you can just take this square and you can make this factor right and if you plot the frequency against that you see almost all frequencies are on this straight line right and of course all those parameters uh, all that uh, data that you saw that all falls on that straight line right because that's of course calculated data so that's what uh, that one parameter family of curves i was referring to and and then you realize that the frequency is directly proportional to this so this is a scaling law i was after you know we were we were trying to discover what is the scaling law that uh, nature is using okay so this is this is the scaling law and this is what uh, nature uses to design their harps so that they have these individual frequencies okay now now look at uh, the the speakers that we use right this is a uh, you know in your in your cell phone what kind of speakers you have you have this uh, this speaker that you can see right here you know uh this is what is used these speakers are pretty much same as uh, the speakers that you have in your house is the electromagnetic uh, speakers um they are relatively large and they generally don't have very good efficiency you know power efficiency so we started thinking that can we replace them with mem speakers okay now if you look at headphone speakers headphone speakers also use the same kind of speakers you know that um uh, you know if you if you remove this uh you can see um uh, let's see uh you know this is this is done by one of my students mira who worked on this uh speakers uh the mems speakers i'll show her work in a second but we thought that we we could show you what these speakers are like so if you rip off the you know headphone uh, outer casing then you will find what is inside and inside you will find the speaker okay speaker has uh, you know a, a metal frame around it um and uh, uh the speaker itself can be taken out and that's what the speaker looks like okay it's the same um electromagnetic speaker that is uh, uh, with the with the coil that is used for all speakers and it has been used for now 100 years um you know this is the metal casing this is the outer casing that fits into your ear so that uh this is bluetooth and battery uh which is there and if you look at the the speaker itself you know this speaker look at that okay uh the the top sheet or the membrane that vibrates comes out and it has this coil right it's it has this conductive coil and you can see the 
magnets here. Okay, so in between the two magnets sits this coil, and uh, when you when you pass current through that, you know, magnetic field is in one direction, and you have uh, the, the current flow in another direction. So current flow is going along the coil, and magnetic field is between the two magnets like this. So obviously the force that you get, uh, you can do Lorentz force, and you will get a force which is upwards. And that's how this, this thing vibrates. Um, well, I mean, there was vibration also, but we are running out of time. So, you know, I could have shown you vibration and uh, how, how it produces that. So now we started working on MEMS speakers. Based on how crickets actuate, we wanted to design MEMS acoustic uh, speakers uh, based on what we learned from there. So what we did was, what we learned from the cricket was that at the wing, there is one side, a set of teeth that is being uh, pushed, okay, or that is being actuated to vibrate the entire uh, heart, right? So it is peripheral actuation. It's not the central actuation, which is done in all these speakers that you just saw. You know, this is central magnet and, uh, you know, uh, the, the magnet around it and then the coil, and that's how it is pushing this uh, membrane up so it's a central actuation. We don't do that. We do peripheral actuation. So we made electrostatic speaker where you have this gap. This, uh, this gap here you see is the annular gap like this. You have a membrane on top, which, is, uh, which has an electrode on it or it's conductive either way. And this, this bottom part here also it is conductive, okay? It is conductive here. This is the cross section. So this is, you know, circular. As you can see, there is annular part. So now, uh, if you apply electrostatic field between this and this, by the way, I mean, this, this little part should have been a different color so that you could recognize it that this is an insulator. Okay, so these two uh, electrodes are not connected. You have an insulator in between. So now you will have electrostatic force here. And with that electrostatic force, you can actuate the membrane. And that's, that's precisely what we do. So uh, with that, we built MEMS, uh, speak, MEMS speakers. Okay, these, these tiny things that you see, those are speakers. Okay, uh, absolutely thin. Um, they are about two microns thin, very, very thin. And uh, you can... Uh, uh, create one for earphone, you can create one for headphone, you know, array of speakers you can do, you can make array of, array, you know, so that you can even have a picture frame speaker. So you can create this and, uh, you know, I'm not going to go through this because we don't have time, but the bottom line is that our peripheral actuation works very well because it gets rid of, uh, you know, this phenomena called, um, uh, the pull-in, you know, if it is vibrating like that, right, uh, it's all okay. But if it vibrates a little bit more than one third of the gap, you know, up to one third of the gap, electrostatic uh, uh, force and uh, elastic force, restoring force, the balance, and it, it works very well. But if it goes below one third of the gap, then electrostatic force all of a sudden pulls it down and that's called pull-in voltage and you know, this whole thing collapses. So in this, in this particular construction of our, uh, of our uh, uh, speaker or the, <laughs> the membrane that vibrates, you see there is this, this thing is not continuous up to here. Okay, this bottom uh, plate is not continuous up to here. If it was continuous up to here, then this membrane could only come down by one third. That's all. Otherwise, more than one third, it will get uh, it will get stuck. It will get sucked by the bottom electrode, and it will get stuck. So now, peripheral actuation. What it does is it provides this room in between for it to vibrate massively, even without uh, you know uh, having. Uh, 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 sticking or pulling at this point at the at the corners, right? So this is what the smartness of this design is that you can have massive uh, deflection here, okay, and yet you don't get pulled in. 
Okay, so um, that actually gives us almost 240 times, you know, or two orders of magnitude increase in amplitude of motion than if this, this uh, bottom electrode was continuous, then uh, we won't be able to do that. So that was the smartness of our design and uh, we can actuate it, you can hear it, okay? It is going through, let's see, when you start hearing it. This is the sound coming from this uh, tiny speaker, okay? So, you know, the point is that we have been able to make these really, really tiny speakers which, uh, for which all the motivation, all the understanding uh, of how cricket sing, we have put into place. And, uh, you know, you won't hear this very well on your computer because, first of all, my computer is uh, producing the sound here uh, and then it is being transmitted to you and then your speaker is playing. You know, there's a lot of loss in between. So you won't hear it properly, but the point is that it can produce these sounds or reproduce these sounds <laughs> okay. in this tiny speaker. So that's where, that's where we are. And I think that I have run out of time. I was going to show you uh, this nature's gyroscope, but I think that there is just no time. So I'm just only going to, you know, uh, uh, flash these slides to you that mechanical gyros to MEMS gyros to nature's gyros, there is such a huge difference, you know, from mechanical to MEMS gyros. When we came uh, to, to MEMS gyros, we thought that we were doing so well because we have reduced the size. We have, you know, gone from 25 kg to milligram size, you know, and so forth and so on for, from uh, several watts of power to milliwatts of power. But when you look at the MEMS gyros in comparison to how nature's gyros work, it's uh, unbelievable. So now this is a MEMS gyro done in my lab, okay? Um, the way these gyros work is on Coriolis uh, uh, force, on Coriolis effect, okay? Um, and here is what Coriolis force is like. You know, if you are rotating and if you want to throw something in a, in a or if there is a linear, uh, velocity in a rotating frame of reference, then there is another acceleration which is uh, uh, perpendicular to both the angular motion, angular velocity and the linear motion, and that's called Coriolis force. It, uh, as you can see here, this is the linear velocity direction, this is the angular velocity direction, and omega cross v is Coriolis acceleration, and that's why that ball is deflecting when they're rotating, you just can't <laughs> send it to the other person. Okay, so this is used in uh, gyroscopes. You know, this is uh, this is the gyroscope that uh, uh, I was showing you that we have built. These are comb drives to make the proof masses uh, vibrate laterally in this direction. Okay, uh, you can see it that if you apply voltage across these uh, comb drives, then you can drive the these two masses. In, in that particular direction, they will vibrate at whatever frequency you design them to vibrate at, generally uh, a few kilohertz, seven to 10 kilohertz that we use. And if you uh, now put it on, uh, on an object which has a rotation about this direction, then what happens is because of that rotation and the actuation that was happening in this direction, you have a vertical Coriolis uh, acceleration, which starts moving it up and down. If it moves up and down, you can put a bottom electrode here and uh, from change of capacitance between the bottom and uh, and this, uh, this proof mass, you can figure out how much is the deflection because of Coriolis force, and then you can figure out what is the rate of rotation. That's how this, these things work. So, you know, this is, this is the comb drive that drives the, uh, drives this uh, gyro. And you know we have various variants of this. You can you can make it in angular form or in uh, or in uh, you know like rectangular one proof mass. Uh, we have made these gyros for you know various uh, applications. But in nature, you see this uh, fly right. This is a this is a 
soldier fly and it has this organ you know this white thing which is going up and down out of phase with the wing this is called the haltier haltiers are the gyros of this fly that that such a simple structure it is right such a you know is like there is a knob at the end and there is like a cantilever structure and that's it and there are some company form sensilla here which are strain sensors and with that the fly does all the three angular rate uh measurements or or sensing of roll your and pitch just with this three is incredible so we studied this you know i as i said that i have run out of time so i'm not going to go through this uh you know we did lots of lots of uh, experiments to figure out what the stiffness uh in one direction versus other direction is for this haltiers when you try to uh, apply load in one direction in which it actuates it versus with coriolis force when it starts going uh you know vibrating uh, when it starts vibrating in another direction a little bit then in that direction what is the stiffness these are completely different these are from measurements we did a micro ct scan to see what the structure of this uh uh haltier is whether it's hollow inside solid inside what is it you know what kind of asymmetry it has what that asymmetry does to the design because you are after the design template as i told you so we are trying to understand what this uh, design is like and why has nature designed it this way so after studying all of that we realized how wonderful how intelligent how smart how beautiful this design was that with these two haltiers uh, the fly was able to add and subtract and by doing that you know the, the signals that it gets from the two it can uh, figure out what is pitch what is your and what is roll you know it can figure out all the three so the comparison mems gyro and insect haltier you know this is small amplitude motion this is large amplitude motion you know this is fixed actuation direction and this is varying actuation direction because it's a large motion so the velocity vector changes its direction unlike uh, in mems gyro it's single axis actuation um, but here same actuation multi axis sensing you know uh, single frequency design for actuation and sensing here it is uh, two frequency design for the two so there are lots of differences between the two and uh, and the nature's design is far far better than the design that we have so nature is full of incredibly intelligent and elegant designs insect world is perfect for studying nature's engineering at micro and nano scales we need to discover these design templates and scaling laws and we need to have new breed of researchers trained across bio and engineering to work on bio inspired systems so with this i conclude my talk and uh, these are the people who have uh, you know who have worked with me uh, vamsi was my phd student meera was my phd student rijuana was my phd student they um, rijuana worked on the insect haltiers meera worked on mems uh speakers that are based on what vamsi discovered from crickets and uh, sanjay sane at ncbs and bhavani balakrishnan from ecological sciences they have been my collaborators on this project funded by mit and drdo np mas program so that's all we have to uh, share with you thank you very much